I want to introduce you to Debbie Millman, who was one of the few women in the United States to run a global brand consultancy. She was president of Sterling Brands. But today she is most known for her podcast, which is called Design Matters. And over the course of her 15-year tenure and hosting that podcast, she's interviewed over 400 creative people. And that's also given rise to one of her six books, which is called Why Design Matters. And we're going to be touching on that today. But Debbie, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. It's really great to be here. I want to just trace back on some of the high beats of your career. When you were at Sterling Brands, and now you think back, how do people stand out or how do brands stand out in a highly competitive market? Would you say that's changed? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think that for a very long time, brands iterated by creating a different form or a different flavor. Um, I think now consumers, people, really want brands that are going to make a difference in their lives. And, and that is a very big shift. I also heard you say that uh, a brand can also be a movement. The, the pink pussy hats or Black Lives Matter, that also requires branding. Yeah, I mean, all of these movements are using the tenants of branding, the same tenants of branding that corporations do. Um, it's not just a tool of capitalism anymore. It's really a tool that humans have been using for millennia to be able to make and mark and record our histories, our shared histories, and to be able to signify our beliefs and our affiliations telegraphically. It, it's, it's a behavior that's almost as old as we are. For those of you that are just joining, I am in conversation with Debbie Millman today, and we are going to follow our usual cadence where I will be in conversation with Debbie for the first 20 minutes, and then we open it up to the last 40 minutes, which are yours, to ask her questions live. Um, Debbie, you founded the first graduate program in branding at the School of Visual Arts here in New York City. Would you say what you've taught over the years about branding has changed? Um... Yes and no. I mean, we've always had a very specific focus on a number of different disciplines, all of which unite to create the overall process of branding. So cultural anthropology, behavioral psychology, uh, economics, statistics, business strategy, uh, and then of course, an aspect of creativity as well. So those have remained fairly constant and I feel that those are even more important now than ever, um, but the way in which the world responds to and with branding is always shifting and changing. And so we always need to be cognizant of that. Our thesis every year is about looking at brands that have fallen out of pace with culture. Mm -hmm. And those brands change every year. And then they also are impacted by the times. And so what's currently happening in the moment heavily, heavily influences the, the thesis project that we do every year with the students. You've interviewed over 400 people, maybe it's 500 people now on your, on your podcast, Design Matters. We had a really robust discussion this morning with some of the ladies that are on the call right now about why a niche matters. You can have a really strong brand, but it's important to have a niche. And you really picked that when you decided to launch this podcast. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because that very same niche that I originally became known for is also also create some boundaries about the way in which the podcast is perceived. So on the one hand, every brand in order to be successful has to sacrifice certain things in order to be other things. You're, you're making a choice to embody a certain attribute or a certain positioning. Therefore, by the sheer exercise in doing that, you're sacrificing all these others. When I started Design Matters, and this is something that happens to a lot of companies or founders that start things with a very small intention, 
you know, I was doing it at the time as something to reignite my creative spirit without the foresight to think, you know, what happens if you're doing this in 17 years? What will you be wanting to do with it? You know, you don't always know these things. You often don't know these things. And so in as much as I started the show back in 2005, as a way to reignite my creative spirit, talk to my design heroes. You know, had I known that I'd be doing it 17 years later and that I'd want to, just because of my personality, evolve it in some way, Mm -hmm. I might not have thought about keeping such a narrow focus with the name that Mm -hmm. is very specifically signaling design. Um, Now, as a brand consultant, I know what the ramifications are of changing a name 17 years into a tenure. And so I'm somewhat reluctant to do that. I've tried to re-engineer the understanding of the name by trying to explain it as how the world's most creative people design the arc of their lives. But that's not telegraphic. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and and then your series of interviews that have now culminated in the book, Why Design Matters. I know why you probably didn't change it because you've got so much now brand equity and then in that in that title of design, you really the book's a missive, right? It's it's a way for people to live their lives a little more intentionally. So I have a series of questions in that spirit that I wanted to ask you for the benefit of the group here. Sure, My first sure. question is around rejection. How do you deal with it? Not well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any uh, hacks on on dealing with rejection. Um, I generally feel very wounded when I am rejected uh, for anything. Mm -hmm. And it takes me a while to recover. But what I can say about rejection is that it's really only a failure if you accept defeat with that rejection. Rejection Mm -hmm. is a very externally driven factor. Somebody else is telling you no. Mm -hmm. you are not saying no, the other party is saying no. Mm. And so you have to decide in that moment, well, is that the empirical evidence that this is a doomed endeavor? Or is it just one person's opinion that it's not a good fit? And so I try to think of it more or less in, in that way, that rejection on my best day is a not now not a never. Mm -hmm. And it also doesn't mean that anybody else that I approach with the idea is not going to think it's a wonderful idea and and potentially be all in. I was out to dinner with a BC last night and he was telling me about a deal that he passed on. He's like, but it's a no for now. If they can figure out their shit, he's like, we'll come back. But for now, it's a no. So why is courage more important than confidence. I often say this when I I teach a masterclass in public speaking, and I think women come and enroll because they think they're gonna get confidence. But I really think at the end of it, it's courage that is the big transformation that happens for them. Why is that more important? I mean, this is something I learned after an interview with Danny Shapiro, the writer, who after we exited my studio at the School of Visual Arts, came to my office and saw a stack of books on my desk, all about confidence. Um, I, at the time, was particularly interested in the topic matter. She looked at the books and she was like, oh, I think confidence is really overrated. And I was like, what? Confidence to me is the holy grail. And she felt that, you know, overly confident people can sometimes be off-putting and feel less than human. And she said that she felt that courage was more important than confidence because you need that faith in taking that first step. And and you don't ever have that confidence in that first step. That's something that's manifested Mm -hmm. over time. And ultimately I thought a lot about that. I thought a lot about that conversation ever since and have determined that real confidence is, is manifested and developed and grown over the successful repetition of any endeavor. So if you do something enough times successfully, you begin to expect that you're gonna be able to do it again. There's that repetitive pattern that you can recognize in the muscle memory of doing the thing again. Mm -hmm. Whereas the first time you do something, um, you don't have that to fall back on. And so often you might fall doing it. Um, Mm -hmm. We are born, with a certain exuberance in doing things we don't know how to do Mm -hmm. just because we're helpless. 
but grow to learn how to do those things really without any sense of conscious confidence. We just learn how to do them. We're not afraid of falling. We're not afraid of making a mess. We're not afraid of pooping in our diaper. You know, we learn over time how to do things that we then take for granted, but we all now have confidence doing those things if we're able-bodied. So I think that we expect to have a certain level of confidence before we try things. Mm. But that doesn't come until we try things. So it's a bit of a conundrum. And that's where the courage comes in, right? The courage yeah. to be authentic, the courage, the courage to be vulnerable. To it. Yeah, the courage to do it, even when you know you're not sure, when you're uncertain about the outcome. And, you know, part of the other problem in all of this is our brains. You know, we, we are hardwired to try to avoid uncertainty, to avoid mm -hmm. vulnerability. That's really part of our reptilian brain, which is the oldest part of the brain, the most sort of prehistoric part of our brains, which also regulates all of our involuntary behavior. So we don't will ourselves to blink. We don't will our hearts to beat. We don't will our lungs to breathe. These things we do without having to think about doing them. And fear is the same thing. The adrenaline spike that we get when we might be in danger is our body warning us to be hyper alert. We can't will that adrenaline. We can't will the fear to go away. And so we have to take that into account when trying new things and give ourselves the opportunity to experience what that feels like while still moving forward and doing it anyway. Hmm. I think our brains are also designed to keep us very safe and to place things and categorize things. Yeah. Yeah. They're regulation machines. Our brains are regulation machines. When we're hungry, we want to eat. When we're full, we'll stop eating. When we're cold, we want to be warmer. When we're too hot, we want to be cooler. Our brains regulate our bodies in that way. And the response to fear is very much a bodily function. What about deserving? What is a non-negotiable for you when it comes to deserving? I don't know. Um, you know, I struggle with worthiness and I struggle with value and I struggle with being enough. And so I, I don't really feel that I'm an expert in, in worthiness or in non-negotiables. You know, for me, when I graduated, I recognized that a non-negotiable was where I lived. Um, I wanted to live in Manhattan. That became the non-negotiable without my even realizing it. I sort of set my whole life up around where I wanted to live and did everything possible to ensure that that could happen. Um, but, but these days, in terms of the non-negotiable, I don't know, the older I get, the harder it, it feels to declare these things empirically. I, I wrote a post this morning saying that I actually cried the first time I moved to New York because I was in Thompson Square Park and someone offered me a smoke as those little drug dealers that sell marijuana in the park. And I'd never experienced that before. And New York was not where I wanted to move. And here I am 24 years later. I mean, you sort of built your whole like first early years of your life around wanting to move to Manhattan and live in the village. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That was everything that I wanted. That was really the only thing for sure that I knew I wanted. Debbie, you, you say that most people think about the why in life, then they think about the what, and then they think about the where, but you would actually put the where first. And why is that? What's the context? Um, I always just felt this very profound soul connection to Manhattan. I'm a native New Yorker, so it's not like I had to move from like India to <laughs> New York. I, I, it was a very different situation. I was born in Brooklyn. I then moved to Queens, Howard Beach, Queens with my family, then Staten Island. And then my parents got divorced. My dad moved to Manhattan. My mom moved to Long Island. She took us with her. But, you know, we were shuttled back and forth between Manhattan and, and uh, Long Island. But I had never lived on my own in Manhattan, which is which is something that I, I felt in my soul was part of my my destiny, I guess. And that really trumped the why and the what, didn't it? Yes. Well, 
in some ways it didn't, in some ways it didn't. I knew this is where I wanted to live. This felt just very profoundly necessary, but I also needed to be self-sufficient. My parents weren't going to help. I didn't want to go back and live, live with either of them. It was too volatile and very dysfunctional. Um, so I also needed to be in a position to take care of myself, to be self-sufficient. And mm -hmm. so that did require, especially because at the time it was very hard to find apartments in Manhattan. They were very expensive. Um, I needed to be able to support myself. And that's what became the lead gene in going into commercial art as opposed to fine art, because I knew that I'd be able to make a more dependable, reliable income. Does that decision-making process still inform how you make decisions today? Do you think about the way? Sadly, yeah, it does. It doesn't have to, but this is a really good example about how sort of foundational issues that kind of provoke or motivate the choices that you're making in life don't go away unless you deal with the foundation. You know, for me, it was, okay, I want to be safe and secure. So therefore I need to be able to support myself. Well, you can still support yourself and still not feel secure and safe. And so mm -hmm. I've been grappling with that and battling with that my whole life, because no matter what you do externally, if you don't feel that internally, nothing externally is going to transform that feeling. It might help, it might buoy it, um, it might not be as intense, but it's still there. One of the students, uh, one of the exercises to do with your students is the 10 year future you exercise. Um, we actually were talking about that on a peer mentoring call this morning. What is the future you exercise and why do it? Um, this is an exercise that I undertook while I was in a summer intensive program at the School of Visual Arts with Milton Glaser. Mm -hmm. And it was an exercise he gave us, wherein we had to, he asked us to envision a day five years into the future where we were living exactly the life we wanted to be living. Where, how, what we were doing, what we were making, did we have partners, children, pets, um, traveling, what, what did our homes look like, Every, everything, like to the my most, most minute detail. And I undertook the exercise with great zeal <laughs> and then sort of forgot about it. And it was, I had written it all in a journal that I had been working on at the time that I took to class with me and was writing my notes in and was looking for some notes about a year later from a completely other in experience and came upon my 10 year plan, no, my five year plan. And uh, was sort of astounded to see that many of the things that I had written on that original, in that original essay and on the list that I, I also made at the time were manifesting. And then started to pay more attention to it over the years and found, took about 13 years for most of it to happen, but it was sort of astounding, this magical little exercise. And so when Milton stopped teaching, I asked him if I could start teaching that exercise. And he said, yes, I changed it to a 10 year plan because my students were a lot younger than the students in his class. His class was for mid-career designers looking to reboot their creativity. My students are more at the beginning of their careers. And so I wanted them to have a bit more runway, especially since it took me the amount of time it did to do the things that were in my plan. I'm gonna finish with this before I turn it over to questions, but um, one of the gals on this call today wants to become um, chief marketing officer by June, July. And I asked her to do what I call a bullshit audit, where you basically ask some people for some brutal feedback on how you come across, because what might be standing between you and what you want is how you are perceived. And I wondered if you could weigh in on that. That sounds brilliant. I ask my students to write an essay about how what they think their first impression is. Mm -hmm. uh, not because they want to be CEOs or CMOs because they're much younger, but just when they're interviewing, how do they come across? And ultimately try to imbue the knowledge that your impressions can be intentional. You can decide how you want to come across. And if you are perceived in certain ways, the only way that you can change that perception is to work on changing that perception. It's not gonna magically change. You're not gonna suddenly meet a whole slew of people that really get you in ways that other people didn't. That's just not gonna happen. And so I, I do think you can create 
some intentions for how you'd like to be perceived and then work towards fulfilling that. And, and fix it in real time when someone gives you that feedback. So I'm actually going to start with Nidhi Sinha, who is Director of Public Communications and Global Communications at uh, BCG. Nidhi, what is your question this afternoon? Well, um, first of all, apologies for not being on video, Debbie and Joya. I'm in a hotel room and the internet is really spotty. Um, so I do hope you can hear me well, though. Yes. Um, Oh, wonderful. Debbie, thank you so much for doing this and, and, and for your time. Um, you know, I would, one of the things that um, has been interesting to sort of see for me and, and has been a real um, catalyst for the trajectory of my career um, is the role of um, allies and mentors in active meetings, right? Like how meetings are run. Um, you know, so much of what I do, I, I work on crisis communications. And so that involves me spending a great deal of time with the highest level um, of leadership at the firm. Um, and so much at the beginning of my career was really dependent on people creating the space at the table and, and almost like sort of recognizing the expertise um, that comes, uh, uh, you know, with, with, with having certain experiences. My question to you, Debbie, is, is that an active sort of you know, train of thought one ought to have throughout um, or is that is, is it almost like a crutch if you're waiting for others to create that space for you? And is there or is there maybe a healthy balance to how you get to that? So I'm I'm curious, what do you mean by creating the space? Yeah, and so you know when when uh, really important and critical decisions are you know uh, being made at senior levels, um, who was in the room becomes important, and so you know there are leaders who understand that there have to be various perspectives in the room um, just based on functional. Um, uh, ways of a company working. So if you're making, so for example, currently, if you're making decisions about whether you should continue work in Russia or not, you may want people from, you know, your risk and your legal teams and perhaps your communications teams and your HR teams, et cetera. Um, it doesn't, you know, so there's, there's sort of like the broader functional idea of it, but then who in that case gets to represent and be the voice on certain areas that I think is the space creation that needs to happen. Cause there's several people that could probably weigh in. Um, and is that something that, you know, you have advice on working actively towards, or, do, you know, do you, do you sort of like position yourself? Well, I think that anybody you're inviting to a round table for any reason should be invited to speak. I don't think that anybody should come to a round table where they're actually have a seat at the table without having a voice. You know, one of the things that I tell young designers that want a seat at the table is, well, make sure you have something to say when you get to the table. It's not just the getting to the table, it's also contributing when you're at the table. And I think if you're inviting anyone or if anybody is inviting you to participate in a round table, which generally means a discussion of some sort, then everybody should be given the space to contribute. Otherwise, it feels highly hierarchical and also somewhat dismissive of the actual people that you have in the room. Why are they there? Are they there just to get consensus? Are they there to agree? Are they there for a sort of a CYA moment? So I think that if anybody is invited or is included, then they should have a role or not be included. Thank you. Meghna Shah is on the partner track at PwC. Meghna, what is your question for Debbie? Thanks, Joya. And thank you, Debbie. This has been so insightful. And I've been, uh, you know, reading up a little bit more. And I kind of heard your podcast as well. So I'm really excited to, to do more of that. And thank you for taking the time. I think the part that I am most excited to hear from you, right, about is uh, the personal branding and the personal design, right? So mm -hmm. I, I work in product and innovation with emerging technology. So I have this theory that if I think of myself as a product that I'm trying to market, right? Like what are the features I have that the customer wants, right? And that's that's something that I'm currently working on on defining for myself as I get ready for the next level. So I'm curious to hear from you, Debbie, like what are some of the um, aspects or criteria that you look at when you're designing a brand for a person? 
I don't, I don't believe that a person should aspire to be a brand. I have very, very strong, somewhat controversial feelings about this. Um, I think that brands are manufactured. Brands aren't real in, in the way that we think about what is real. They don't mm -hmm. live it, breathe on their own. They're constructions made by people. Fair enough. People can own a brand. People can manage a brand. But once we begin to see ourselves as brands, we begin to lose all of our humanity. Brands are manufactured. <laughs> Humans are, are, are alive. Brands are not alive. A person Perfect. Can own and a that's brand. a good correction of words. But yeah, yeah. If, if I were to build a brand for myself, yeah, what would that look you're like? You're not building a brand, you're building a character and a reputation. Mm -hmm. okay. And that that a brand is the result of sound strategic positioning in the marketplace. It's a journey. Positioning is the journey, brand is the result. And that brand is then a fixed moment in time. Brands can evolve, but they're only evolved by the people evolving the brand. They don't evolve on their own. We evolve on our own. We evolve, we grow, we change, we speak, we don't speak, we contribute, we don't contribute, we make, we don't make. Brands are only directed by people. So I don't, part of what I don't understand with the whole notion of personal branding is why would somebody want to be a brand, then you're saying you're not self-directed anymore. You know, you're just being directed by the marketplace. And so I really encourage the notion of developing a reputation, developing your character, and then creating a body of work that then represents that character and, and that reputation. Now that's different from somebody like Kim Kardashian launching Skims. Mm -hmm. You know, she owns that brand. And she makes that brand, she directs that brand, but that's not the only brand. She might have other makeup lines and whatever else she's going to be making in the future. If she sees herself only as a brand, she sees herself as a fixed modality that then isn't including all of the sort of messiness of being human. Now she's, first she's married to Kanye, now she's not married to Kanye. How does, that, that, that's all part of who her character and reputation is, but it's not her brand. Her brand is Skims. And she might not see it that way, but I do. Um, <laughs> but I, but I really urge people to reconsider the notion of personal branding because, in many ways, I feel like it's an oxymoron. Mm. Brands are impersonal. You know that you don't talk to brands, and you know you might cuddle up with a pillow, but you're not cuddling up with the brand. You're cuddling up with the pillow. So you know, this is an area where I'm doing a lot of research, a lot of investigation, because I think the minute we aspire to be personal brands and not to say that you are, but just in general for anybody that, that aspires that. And so many people do. Um, I feel like it, it takes this sort of soulfulness of, out of what it really means to be human and alive. Minachi. No, I, I, I fully, and I don't want to, of course, I know there's, there are other folks, right? But no, absolutely. That, that, that's what I was trying to get to a little bit more that as you are building a brand, the pieces that you talked about, the character, the reputation, right? It's not that, oh, I'm aspiring to become a brand, right? Um, so it's 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 the latter for sure. Uh, what are some of the things to be mindful of? But I think I think I have my answer. Thank you. Okay, great. That's a great question. I'm I'm really glad you asked it. And actually dovetailing out of that, Carolyn Benitez this morning said that she wants to really position herself as a thought leader, she's in the retail space, very specifically focused on accessories. She's in senior leadership at a company. She's had a long history in that space, but she's like, she wants to become a thought leader. Carolyn, I don't know if that's a question that you have for Debbie today, but I thought it dovetailed nicely out of this. Thank you, it absolutely does. Hi, Debbie, thank you so much Hi, for your time. Um, sure. I really appreciate your perspective. Um, I think you've touched on so many nerves for me um, regarding where you said that you really had to make a choice in your life about fine art versus commercial art. And I feel like that's exactly sort of how I've landed in the position that I have. Um, I started making jewelry out of hardware parts. I'm a self-taught artist, um, just it needed to come out. And that has, you know, oh. parlayed me to working with, you know, Federated Merchandising Group and doing their executive training program all the way through to, you know, running an organization um, for myself and then also for another individual. Um, I'm at a place now where 
I have, you know, 20 plus years experience in the field and I'd love your take on how to really position myself to grow that reputation out in the market. You know, it's one thing to do the day to day. Um, it's another thing as I, we were discussing this morning in our leadership circle, um, how do you actually position yourself so that you can build that reputation, as you said, and I'm not trying to be unauthentic. I think really from the heart, that true creativity is really what speaks to me through every line of what I'm doing in the, the, the product market out there, whether it's from merchandising, product development, the sales aspect. Um, but I want to be known as an expert. And what would you say is the one of the best steps I could take to um, sort of grow that within my career and my next steps forward? Such a great question, Carolyn. Um, I have a couple of thoughts on this. First, you have to have something that you know you want to say to be associated with. So thought leadership comes from having thoughts that are leadership worthy. If you feel like you have those, then you need to put them out there. And, you know, there was, after I did my TED talk, I was thinking about putting together like a little, a little animation from the very, very first talk that I gave, the first sort of public talk that I gave to a little tiny chapter of the American Marketing Association back in 1995. And how that then led to that, then to that, then to that, then to that. And I did my TED talk in 2019. It was launched in 2020. So figure at that point, it's 25 years. 25 years of speaking at anywhere and anything. And some people get a TED talk right out of the gate. You know, they come up with something amazing and you know, they're 28 and they do a TED talk. But that wasn't the case for me. I was in my late fifties. I had started speaking in my thirties and I started speaking at, you know, little rinky dink organizations that would have me. And that's, that's the way I started. I started writing for rinky dink little blogs and then bigger blogs and then bigger, you know, and it took, it's taken, I'm 60. So I started to sort of put my work out there when I was in my thirties, cause that's really how long it took till I had anything that was even mildly worthy of putting out there. And so I would say, make a long-term plan of what you want, but also don't be very, don't be too hard on yourself with where you expect to be in a year or two years. Part of what I think really helped me grow my reputation was my podcast. But I started my podcast 17 years ago when nobody was doing podcasts. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would suggest, and, and this is what I have my, my students do as well, embark upon a self-generated project. It could be a magazine, it could be a daily musing, it could be a newsletter of sorts, it could be a podcast, anything that is directed by you, that's fully your voice, that isn't um, in any way corrupted by a decision maker other than yourself, and put it out there and do it on a regular basis, do it weekly or monthly or <clears throat> determine what that schedule is and then adhere to it. And that will over time provide or create a groundswell where if the, if the content that you're making is, is reaching people you know, emotionally, then they'll keep wanting more. So that's, that's really what I would recommend. The, the hard thing about doing this is that it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Yeah, you have to be consistent as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I recommend that before anybody put anything out, any kind of self-generated anything, that they tr they do 10 versions of it. So if it's a podcast, do 10 before you publish the first one. Mm -hmm. Over the 10, you'll begin to see a little bit more about what you want to do, what you want to say, um, and you'll have a bank of, of a, a little bit of a body of work that then you put out there. If you're going to write something, write 10 posts, then put them up on Medium one at a time over the next 20 weeks. That's half a year. That gives you a chance to then promote it, to send it out to people, to do some social media around it. And so you have all of the material first, 
and then you plan your marketing plan in the same way you would for any other um, thing that you were launching for one of your clients. Minakshi Mahadam so used to be at a nonprofit called Magic Bus. Minakshi, I think you've moved on. What is your question for Debbie? Um, well, actually, um, it's really been interesting, Debbie, to hear some of what you've said. And I just loved your idea around uh, what you spoke about personal branding. Um, I've, uh, I'm more of an ambivalent person and never sort of felt comfortable with being out there and really branding myself. Um, my work, however, uh, because I'm in fundraising has involved um, really being able to talk about what I do, uh, support the cause very vocally, and also interact with um, C-level executives. Uh, so it's been sort of, um, while though I'm not that comfortable by going out there, but I've really had to elevate uh, the cause that I'm uh, uh, connected with at all times. So one of the things that I've, uh, uh, as Zoya mentioned that I recently changed my job. One of, uh, instead of uh, in my last job, I was in a role where um, uh, you could say it was almost a CEO kind of a role for a very well-known uh, nonprofit, global nonprofit. And instead of stepping up, a lot of my colleagues thought that I would probably be moving on to another organization in a CEO role. However, I stepped back and into a smaller, more- Actually, uh, I just want you to get to your question because we want to make sure everybody gets a two. Okay. Sorry, okay. <laughs> into a narrower role. So one of the things that um, I've been uncomfortable about is when you are a senior person and you are putting a, a, certainly you're not wanting to step into leadership roles, but you want to, uh, be in a narrow role, how do you still define yourself as a, a expert and a senior person while not being in a position like that? What position are you currently in? I'm in a director uh, level role right now. Isn't, wouldn't that still be considered a leadership role? No, not really. I was uh, in uh, the leadership role in my last organization, but not here. And so the question is, how do you present yourself as a leader if you're not currently leading? Exactly. And a subject, and a subject matter expert as well. Well, the subject matter is still the subject matter. I don't, if you're an expert in a subject, in subject matter, you're a leader in that realm of, of thinking. So I don't think that that should... Such a matter is the, uh, actually, okay, uh, I'm seen as a leader in that, but okay. within the organization, uh, how do I still appear that as a um, leader, even though it's a much smaller role? I think it's really the way you show up every day. You know, leadership, you know, we all know leaders that aren't leaders. <laughs> you know, leaders, the, you know, I think the real I, and I would look this up and actually I'll send it to Joya so she can send it to you. The best definition of leadership I've ever encountered was in um, David Foster Wallace's essay, Consider the Lobster. He wrote it in, um, he wrote an essay in Rolling Stone in 2000. He was covering um, the election campaign in the United States. And he wrote an article about what that was like and talked about what real leadership is. And real leadership is getting people to do harder, um, more difficult things than they'd be able to do on their own. Mm. And we know plenty of leaders that have leadership titles, but are narcissists and selfish and, and are not committed to really leading with authenticity. So whether or not you have the title doesn't mean you can't behave as a leader. I love that, Debbie. Thank you. Sure. Al Alison Holzer is co-CEO of a company called Inspire Core. She is usually in a coaching capacity at the C-level with client engagements. Alison, what is the question? Sure. Hi, thanks so much, Debbie. I'm learning a lot from, uh, from their talk today. I, um, something that came to mind, I haven't thought about this for a while, but, but it's intriguing and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. I, um, so in preparing, I, I have done um, 
a TEDx talk myself on inspiration, which we have original research on. And one of the things I was preparing for that talk, you know, thought about different topics and coaching is a big area of passion of mine, particularly around the idea of coaching mindset, coaching approach, not, not so much coaching as a um, sort of service per se. And, um, and it's really what got me into the work that I do today. And it's a topic that I've written a lot about, but I've never spoken on it publicly. I haven't done a keynote on coaching or coaching mindset. And one of the reasons why I have not is because when I was doing prep for the talk and I was floating around different ideas at the time, um, I received feedback from, from someone who kind of is in that world, expert in that world, that the topic would come across as salesy. Mm -hmm. And that of course, you know, got my spine tingling you. I don't want to, I don't want to come across as salesy. Uh, but it's also something that I'm really passionate about. And so I've stayed away from talking about the topic. I've written about it. Oh, I'm just about, curious about coaching, coaching, coaching mindset, coaching approach. Um, just Why would that my... be considered salesy? I, I mean, are you know. sure that that person's opinion is, is valuable to you? Had you, had you ever gotten that feedback before? They were a person who ran, ran TEDx events and had kind of worked in that field for, for many years. And so I'd seen a lot of different topics and speakers and ones that were more successful, less successful kind of thing. So it was just one person's opinion, but I think it was one where I took it to heart and, and I was okay with it. I love the topic I ended up talking about, but I think it's left in my mind kind of a lingering question around, would I ever want to do a talk on this topic? Because if it comes across this way um, to others, that wouldn't be what I would want. So I'm just curious well, from a brand. Yeah, I would look up. Uh, so there are two, two coaches that I really, really respect. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I don't say that lightly because I, I'm, I don't, I, I'm approached by a lot of people to be on the podcast. And mm -hmm. so it, I had two coaches on last season, which I mm -hmm. never do. Dory Clark and mm -hmm. Alyssa Cohn. Mm -hmm. I would look them both up. They mm -hmm. have they, so especially Dory, because Dory is really about personal coaching and how to develop mm -hmm. a voice and how to become a thought leader. She is a phenomenal, phenomenal resource in this regard. Mm -hmm. So I would look her up because I think you'll get a lot of tips about style, about presentation. And I would engage with, if there's somebody that you know that, that teaches presentation training, make the presentation to that person, see what they think. Because I think if you're offering a way for people to understand how to become better at what they do, mm -hmm. kind of the opposite of salesy. So <laughs> and just, just as an FYI, not, not to say, I know nothing about this TEDx person. I was supposed to do a <laughs> TEDx talk in Bermuda one year. And I was in Bermuda for another reason at the same time. Um, so it worked out that I was doing this one thing and then also doing the other thing. And the TEDx people wanted me to change my talk mm -hmm. so significantly that I ended up withdrawing. Mm -hmm. I, I ended up saying thanks, but no thanks. Mm -hmm. um, and then did a kind of version of that talk on the TED stage, which then mm -hmm. became one of the top 10 talks of 2020. Mm -hmm. So I would get more than one opinion. Okay. And Allison, cool. just been listening to you and knowing you, I feel mm -hmm. like you, your, your whole coaching mindset is something I've heard Magna talk about. Magna mm -hmm. has a team that reports into her and she really needs to come to them from a coaching mindset as a leader, as we talked about from Minakshi versus somebody who is just their manager, right? Yeah. And yeah. so I've heard Magna talk about that. And that, that could be somebody who would be a consumer of a topic mm -hmm. you would give. And Meghna is very much about wanting to learn that anyway. Ooh, so I think yeah. she could be an ideal audience for you to give that talk to. Yeah. Uh, oh, Dina but I would also say, Joya, reach out to Dory because she does a lot of talks. She does a lot of work with organizations. She's very into women's leadership. Yeah, uh, Dory has been she... here before as well. We oh, okay. When she was promoting the long game and I often quote her book. Uh, yeah. I wanna make sure I get around to everybody here because we have another 15 minutes. Dina Seeger is CEO of a company called iBalance Life, which is a patented wellness concern. She also has a consultancy. Dina, what is your question for, um, for Debbie today? Um, well, first off, thank you so much. And I actually love when people present something that's against um, popular opinion. So the where instead of the why, 
and then the character instead of the brand. So that immediately perked my ears up and made me want to read your book and listen to you even more. Like it's, I, I love that part. Thank you. So since we kind of touched on the character building piece, I'll, I'll leave that out because I had questions in there. And I want to look at the why part. So when you think about the why, can you think about how that maybe changed your decision process? And did you think about why only in terms of she, um, the where in terms of geographic location or where in terms of more of an abstract definition of where and how that might inform your strategy about building because where to me is also a, an extremely important thing but not always obtainable. So just kind of your insights on how you bring that into your thoughts even now as you do what you're doing. Um, well, you know, I made a decision about where I wanted to live um, 40 years ago. <laughs> so I graduated college in 1983. So it's 39 years. And um, at the time, I wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to do for a living. And I knew I wanted to do something creative, but I didn't know exactly what, and, you know, the fantasy dream was being a fine artist, but the and, and what's interesting is that for years, you know, for years, I thought I had compromised. And I've talked about this quite a lot. Um, I did a commencement speech that was all about this, where I thought I had compromised what I wanted to be in my life because I was... Um, driven by the where. Driven by the where and driven by the security. No, and not, no, not driven by the where, no. It was, I was at the time compromised that I had picked a path of commercial art in order to be secure. But it, that wasn't, I was lying to myself. I picked a path of commercial art to support where I wanted to live. And I didn't want to be a bartender or a waitress at the time because it was too unstable. And so this is what, you know, one of the things that Joy asked at the beginning about my non-negotiable. When I graduated, there were a whole slew of things that I wanted for my life. You know, I was looking at my whole life in front of me, what did I want? And I made certain decisions and was very sort of waxing sentimental about the fact that, oh, I compromised, I went into commercial art instead of fine art, I'm not an artist, I'm a designer, blah, 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 blah. And you know, this whole notion of, should I have made a different decision? But then, and I would say it was only about 10 years ago that I realized, wait a second, I didn't settle. I picked the non-negotiable, the non-negotiable for me at the time, and everybody's is different. Some people it's a where, some people it's a what, some people it's a who. The, the non-negotiable for me was, this is where I wanna live. And in order to be able to pay my rent every month, I need to make a certain amount of money. In order to be able to make a certain amount of money that I can rely on, I need to have a job that's gonna be able to provide that. So if I re-engineered all those decisions back then, I was doing exactly what I wanted. And that was a profound realization. I don't think that we're, when we're on the precipice of making a very, very, very big decision that we can address several needs at once. There often is one non-negotiable. It could be being with a partner. It could be paying rent. It could be a certain kind of um, creative expression. But that's a very personal thing. And everybody has to make that choice for themselves. What I thought I was doing wasn't what I was doing. I thought I was settling, but I didn't. I was actually going after the thing that meant more to me than anything else at the time. Fatima Basrai is in senior leadership at Berlitz. She's in risk and compliance. Uh, Fatima, what is your question? Thank you. Debbie, this has been really insightful. So I know as you talked about um, the why, what, where, what about the when? Like, is that something that comes into play? Because you did mention how you've evolved over time. So when is that trigger that you realize that there is that involvement needed? Well, Fatima, this is a tough one because I also think that this has something to do with age. So, you know, now at 60, my mantra is if, if not now, when? If not now, when? At 20, at 30, at 40, not so much. 
But now it's like, how much more am I going to say I'm going to do in the future? And a lot of that, you know, the biggest, the biggest decision I've made in my professional career came when I turned down the CEO job at Sterling Brands in 2016. And I had been president for 20 years. I report that I was the second in command for, and, and you know, going back to Minashki's question about leadership and Max, my vicious predator here. Um, it's okay, it's okay, it's just the mailman. Um, and I had been threatening <laughs> to leave for years, you know, we sold the company to Omnicom. Sterling, I had two, two of the partners, there's three of us all together. We sold the company in 2008. I had a five year earnout, five years. And um, I thought, okay, at the end of the five years, I will leave and do all the things that I said I wanted to do. And I was al already had started the branding program at the School of Visual Arts. So it wasn't that I didn't have an income or insurance or all the things that we need in life. I had made a pretty decent amount of money selling the company. So 2012 comes and I'm like, well, I'm renovating my house. It would be great to have the paycheck, 2013, 2014, 2015. And then in 2015, I get offered this job. Now I've been threatening to go and thinking about an exit strategy and then not, and then thinking about an exit strategy, then not. And I get offered the position of CEO. And then everybody's like, she's never leaving. And, you know, I was really struggling because I thought, okay, well, I'm being offered an opportunity that any person in their right mind would take. I am going to be, you know, the number one person in the company. I will be a female CEO in a sea of many males at Omnicom. I should be doing this, you know, taking one for the team, showing an example, et cetera, et cetera. But I was 55 years old and also thinking if I do this, I'm not going to do any of the other things that I've been wanting to do because being in that number two position did give me a little bit more freedom to be able to take on the side projects, to be able to do the podcast, to be able to teach, to do all the things that I was beginning to do that I really, really loved. And I thought, if I do this, I'm going backwards. Yes, it's a bigger title and it's more money, but when do I get to do the things that I've always said I wanted to do? And it became now. And so I, I decided not to take the job and then planned, really planned my exit strategy in 2016. But, but it was the hardest decision I've ever made. The hardest decision, professional decision I've ever made. But now I, I, what I can say is that decisions are only difficult before you make them. When you make them, it's like, whew, I made the right decision. And I feel like I did, no regrets. I, you know, and people are always like, do you miss working with clients? Do you miss, like, no. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> Our last question comes from Tanya Sterl. Tanya is a personal stylist. She very much would label herself a creative. Tanya, what is your question? Hi, Debbie. So nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. My and husband and are I are definitely a style maven. <laughs> awesome. Oh, thank you. My husband and I, my family, we are huge Star Wars fans. So I'm like, oh, can I touch you through the screen? Like, it's just so cool to find out that you, you know, you're in the makings of Star Wars. Um, and please pardon my delay with hopping on. I'm actually at an all day uh, summit and I was hosting uh, some style coaching circles. So I hopped on as soon as I could. Um, I think I'm relating to the uh, little bit of everything, the what, why, and the when. I'm turning 50, March 11th. Um, Happy birthday. Yeah. Thank you. And the uh, form that my work takes as a personal stylist and the why is giving people permission to fully express themselves for who and how they are, their true essence, right? Inside and out. So the form that that's taking right now is one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, working one-on-one -on -one with clients, speaking, I'm gearing up for more interviews, um, TV, media, all that good stuff. So I guess it's, I know I do this because I love using style as that self-expression tool, the form the work is taking the one-on-one, -on -one, but I feel like there's a, like a, I want to reach more, or there's like a, 
bigger form my work would be taking to reach, you know, to get the message out or reach more people. So it's almost like, what are the questions that you ask yourself or aligning with like a larger cause, like LGBTQ friendly or mental health and wellness, like as it relates to all that. So what are the questions one can ask oneself of like, I know my why, here's the form it's taking, but what questions do I ask myself to be like, could this take a bigger form? Do I align with another cause or mission or like, you know, so, Tanya, global mission? I think I'm- Why don't we pause there, Tanya? Say again? We have four minutes left, so I wanna make sure Debbie can answer you. What is the oh, goal? Yes. What is your goal? <sighs> I believe the goal is to really into, and I usually focus on women, but I'm saying individuals across the world should be g- given permission to visually be who they are without, oh, you need to look or be a certain way. And so how right? do you, how do you um, record the people that you help style? So that's done on an individual basis, um, photography, videos, some interviews of what was their experience that changed for them like before and after and that's on an individual basis are you you allowed like how do i get this bigger (laughs) are you allowed to share that yes absolutely they give me permission so then that's how you make it bigger you need to shout it from the rooftops have a very vibrant in uh social media presence and do that on instagram and do that on facebook and do it on even maybe on tiktok i mean there's so so oh, many ways what you're doing is transforma- transforming people to help them find their best selves. The best way to do that is to show the results of what you're doing, the befores and afters. Do interviews with so, people, talk to them about it, share that. And should it turn into like a TV show where like I interview people from around the world of like their different visual expressions based on their cultures, heritages, histories, or what it means for Like, I feel like there's a bigger form of expression because what you described is what I've been doing for the last 10 years. And I feel oh. like there's this kind of other form or mission it, it needs to take to just reach more people around the world or touch more lives. I don't know so if I'm getting to specific grow your enough. business. So, so, that, so that's what, like, part, why I asked To grow the, the message. To grow the message. So then, yeah, I think pick an organization that you really feel strongly could use your services and then remake the the people in that organization. And that would be a great way to get the word out. I think that's a really nice idea. But Debbie, Uh, I think what I'm hearing you say is that you be really bought into the idea of us seeing the transformation while she's in the dressing room. Maybe and and you know whether you're it's an african woman or an indian woman or a white woman it's really pulling the curtain back and seeing that transformation but not a whole hour of it like get a really great editor and pull out the so i'm yeah so i have that i totally have that nailed down and i don't do things in the fitting room because it's a very private personal space for women like i hold sacred space to let them go through the transformation what i'm trying to do is how do i just aspect like I think you nailed it, Debbie. It's what type of organization or larger, like is it women returning back from the military and now they don't know how to dress for real life, right? Mm -hmm. Or is it people transitioning to be female who are male? Like, what is that idea? I I think that's what it is. Like what, that's what it is. Like this bigger expression. I want to align with like, oh, maybe the women that are overshadowed are not thought of in this room. So thank you. You helped answer you both helped to answer the question so it's choosing that organization to bring this to 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 really improve the lives of a of a yeah and you're volunteering so thank you so you're gifting the world it's fantastic excellent thank you so much sure Tanya thank you so much for joining us today any uh, a last thought before we break um just this is an extraordinary community that I've just been part of for the last hour and thank you for the great questions for the sort of way that you've engaged during this time together and and really good luck to all of you because i've just enjoyed this so much thank you thank you thank you so much debbie we feel very lucky to have you today absolutely thank you thank you so much
Bye.